Good morning, everyone. I'm Tony Bernardo, Dean of UCLA Anderson, and I want to welcome you to another in a series of, uh, 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 of uh, distinguished speaker conversations that we're having here. We're very honored to be joined uh, by not one, but three distinguished guests today. Suzanne Daniels, who is Global Head of Original Content for YouTube, Mike Hopkins, Senior Vice President of Prime Video and Amazon Studios, and John Stanky, President and Chief Operating Officer of AT&T. Welcome to all of you. We're, we're going to have a lot to talk about uh, today, and I apologize that we started just a few minutes late. Uh, we'll uh, go beyond a, a few minutes beyond our normal time, so if you can stay with us perhaps till 1245, that would be terrific. Suzanne Daniels is the global head of original content for YouTube, and she leads the company's overall efforts and investments in, in original content. Before joining YouTube, Suzanne worked as the president at MTV and earlier held positions that included president of Lifetime Television and the WB. Mike Hopkins, an Anderson alum, is senior vice president of Prime Video and Amazon Studios, overseeing all aspects of Amazon's video entertainment businesses. Before joining Amazon earlier this year, Mike was chairman of Sony Pictures Television and previous to that, CEO of Hulu. John Stanky, who is also an Anderson alum, is currently the president and COO of AT&T, and on July 1st, he'll assume the role of CEO, uh, CEO of AT&T, and as of this month, he is a member of AT&T's board of directors. Congratulations, John. As COO, he oversees AT&T Communications and Warner Media, and he oversaw the merger and integration of the former Time Warner Media empire with AT&T. So uh, thank you again, John, Mike, and Suzanne, uh, for joining us. Uh, these are, uh, as we all know, extraordinarily difficult times uh, for the nation. We're not facing just one uh, crisis, uh, but really two crises, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, and now uh, unrest that's been triggered by horrific examples of racial injustice. And these are trying times for uh, the nation and trying times for all organizations. And I want to uh, get your thoughts on uh, how this crisis of, is affecting your companies, your employees, uh, your, your customers, and, and generally the industry moving forward. I know there's a lot to untangle there, uh, but I'd like to get your thoughts on these dual crises that we're facing. Uh, John, perhaps you, you could get us started. Well, it's, uh, first of all, unprecedented, right? And um, I, I can remember thinking back at various points in my career where you went through an event and you said, thank God we're not going to have something like that again, uh, maybe most recently the 2008 financial crisis. And uh, not only are we, you know, in the middle of something again, but it's, it's even more significant, more severe. There's probably some reasons for that. Um, I would tell you that, you know, I, I think it's where it really tests the resilience of an organization as you, as you get into these moments. Um, and I think we're really going to see that in spades. I, I, the COVID piece, it feels like we had probably the worst behind us in terms of our ability to navigate through it and a path out of it and to think about how we're going to run the business. But then you take the gut punch of what's occurred over the last week, week and a half, and um, it, it is, uh, it's a very different kind of experience. Um, I was fearful of uh, a fraying social fabric for probably the last couple of years. It's a topic we've had conversation about. Uh, I didn't expect it was going to be an event like this and necessarily pushed it over the edge, but you know, here we see it. It's, it's incredibly difficult to watch and see this as an individual. And we have you know, employees and individuals that are black that have a dynamic around this that none of us can ever possibly understand who, who don't share that experience. And um, I think one of the conversations we've had internally is um, we've got to do something different this time. Uh, it can't be the typical cycle we've dealt with coming out of um, the past injustices that we've all witnessed. And we've been spending a lot of time the last couple of weeks, um, last week, uh, thinking about what those steps are. Um, I will tell you they're starting to form. Um, we, we haven't made any public announcements about it yet, but I know working with a variety of different levels. Uh, Doug McMillan at the BRT is getting 
very focused on making sure all of American industry um, starts to address this in a different fashion. And I will tell you that AT&T is throwing support behind Doug in that. And I think you'll see um, something coming out of the BRT where a very focused effort on social injustice and what needs to happen to really start to move the ball forward on this where we've been unsuccessful in the past will be probably an element that uh, we'll start to see the light of day here shortly. And I will tell you inside at and we've been talking about beyond what can be done within the construct of something like the BRT or a chamber, what do we need to do in the communities where we have a significant presence, uh, where a significant payer into the tax base, we're a significant employer where our employees have to traverse streets and feel safe about the environments that they come into. And are we really doing everything that we can in our relationships with local government states to drive this in as aggressive a fashion as we can? I, I think we believe there are some things we can do in that regard in, in conjunction with other key residents of cities that we operate in. Uh, to move that along. In places where we don't have that kind of impact, maybe there's another company that can step forward to be much more aggressive on that. But uh, rightfully so, our employees, I think, expect to see a very different posture coming out of this. And I think we're moving to make sure that we can do that. Thanks. Suzanne, would you like to weigh in on this? Absolutely. Um, so like John, we are in the process of um, uh, working on a plan um, for change and change in um, several different ways. Uh, one of which is to support uh, black and diverse creators on YouTube and to support them in product feature ways because there have been some complaints that they feel the algorithm works against them, um, but also to support them in, uh, with sales and revenue. Um, and getting advertisers, uh, working with advertisers to uh, uh, target these, these creators in a, a, a productive way. Um, we're also looking at an ongoing commitment, and we will be making some announcements probably by Friday of this week um, for uh, original content um, fund that will... Uh, that will primarily be working with um, black and again, diverse creators. Um, uh, so, um, you know, and then we're also looking at internal practices. We just had a meeting this morning with HR looking at internal practices of ways we can um, uh, enhance black voices internally uh, in, with, th throughout YouTube. Um, so, there's a lot, a lot going on. I'm glad it's happening. Um, I'm sorry that uh, it had to be instigated in such a hard way, but I'm glad it's happening. And uh, I, I expect to see some significant change at YouTube. Thanks, Suzanne. Mike? Uh, well, I agree, with, I agree with both uh, John and Suzanne and, and how companies can work together to uh, put the full weight of, of of their voices uh, and actions to, to actually make changes on the ground, I think is really important. I think that's something that I know uh, Amazon is, is, is also going to be part of. Um, you know, what we've been really making sure we do here is reach out to our employees. Um, our, our black colleagues are feeling the weight of this viscerally. Uh, there's a lot of anger. Um, they, they, it, it's not just about, um, this one incident, it's been a series of them and, and the way they've been treated uh, in, their, in their perceptions of treatment around their entire lives, right? And so we're, we're spending a lot of time, you know, supporting them, uh, spending time talking with them, trying to learn uh, their views of our company and how can, how can we improve their experience uh, with Amazon. Um, I think it's also critical that, uh, you know, I think it's happened as these things have happened in the past. Um, you know, we we all make statements and things. You know, we put some policies in place. But what what I think is, I know for me and in, in my career and the companies I've worked at in the past, there's been a lack a lack of consistency and per persistence in continuing to make these things uh, happen and, and and see long term results. And so I think more than words, which are super important. 
these actions that we take have to be sustained. There has to be a process and a mechanism to ensure that whether you're talking about diversity uh, in hiring and hiring and leadership, that you follow through on that. I, I think our, our employees and our customers are going to demand that, and they should. And I think just keeping, an, I think for all of us, keeping an eye on that and making their, this a consistent theme uh, and not, not a one-time event is, is really critical. I mean, your industry is so important in, um, in, uh, de in, in uh, developing people's perceptions, beliefs, understandings, history. What, what sort of special uh, responsibilities do you believe that your industry has around content, around deeper understanding, around promoting uh, equity uh, and, and racial justice? Uh, Mike, if you wanna. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think there's, it's multifaceted. Tony, in, the, in that regard, I think there's, you know, not only, you know, diversity at the company, but also trying to find ways to uh, create diversity in front and behind the camera at all aspects of production. Um, that's, that's been something that I know we at Amazon have been working on for the last several years. Uh, it's, it's about being thoughtful and uh, creative about the content we make um, that is that is relevant for 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 the community and, and reaching out to them finding ways to to ensure that that these things are organic and authentic um, that we that we give give a space for those voices to be heard um, and, and and presented on the platforms that we oversee uh, in ways that are that, that are they're that they're entertaining and fun as well I mean th this is about entertainment and it's about Providing people with, with not only a voice but but uh, an urgency to to see communities, to see themselves in the pro in the product that they see, and that's that's something that that we're focused on not only here in the United States but in every country we're serve, serving. You know, local programming with local voices and and, and, and those those faces on the screen um, is is critical for our business and. And it's not just right to do, it's, it's actually really good for business. It's really the right thing to do for customers. Um, and we're a customer-obsessed company, and I think that's, that's also going to be how we drive this. Great. Uh, Suzanne, uh, I know you, uh, you mentioned some of the uh, efforts at, at YouTube. Uh, you know, one of the things um, uh, you know, many people have uh, talked about here in previous uh, seminar, uh, in, in previous discussions we've had is how uh, trends that were uh, uh, that we were seeing pr uh, pre-crisis have been accelerated since then, and uh, I'm sure in the events uh, in in response to the events of the last week or two, do you see uh, um, uh, you know uh, patterns or trends that uh, we were seeing before these twin crises that you believe are really going to accelerate uh, in the in the coming years? Well. You know, yes, uh, I definitely see trends. I, I, I've seen trends over the last three months as a result of the pandemic first. Um, uh, and then different kinds of trends just in the last week. Um, uh, you know, on a positive note for YouTube as a result of the pandemic, watch time was up. Um, but, uh, uh, and, and that was a trend we saw globally. Um, uh, the flip side of that, of course, was that um, sales revenue was substantially down, despite watch time numbers being up. Um, and uh, you know what? What I what I think needs to happen um, is a difficult thing to achieve for a, a company as big as Google. You know, YouTube is owned by Google, of course, which is, and from a content perspective. Um, which is where, where I live, uh, we, we have to um, not be afraid to be controversial. And um, so, you know, for, for instance, we're, we're working on a special event that we're going to announce Friday, most likely. Um, and, I, and I said to everyone at YouTube, there's no way we can execute this no matter how we execute it, that it won't cause controversy. There's just no way. And, um, and look at Nickelodeon, right? Nickelodeon just uh, uh, took an eight minute um, blackout um, uh, and, uh, and got hit hard for it 
but I think they did the right thing as far as I'm concerned. I think Brian Robbins did the right thing and I wrote him a note this morning. Um, so uh, I think, and I, and I, and I think how um, Mike was talking about um, sustained commitment, I think that's critically important too. I think there has to be a, uh, an ongoing commitment to, uh, to, to, not, to not being afraid of controversy and to um, you know, exploring what needs to be explored and said. And I, and I am a long time believer that media and content can move the needle in powerful ways. Um, and I've, uh, and I've, I've, uh, I feel like I've really worked hard to, um, I give, will continue to work hard to um, have content, you know, explore these issues, um, whatever, whatever they may be. Thanks. John, from your perspective, uh, I know uh, you've been in, involved in a lot of uh, acquisitions and integrating a variety of media companies and so on. And I was wondering if these are uh, response, and by the way, a very recent launch of HBO Max. Congratulations. I'm wondering uh, how you see these as a response to trends that we were seeing in the entertainment industry and, and, and whether you see, again, those trends accelerating going forward. I, I definitely see the trends accelerate, and I would tell you, I think there's three things that we're, we're working on or pay attention to right now. The first, a little bit different position, given that we own a significant news outlet, and I would tell you that the responsibility of that organization to um, do what they're chartered to do, which is you know to report the facts and hold those in authority accountable, for decisions that they make um, is, is an incredibly important social responsibility. I'm in, tremendously proud of the CNN organization and what they've been able to do over the course of the last couple of weeks and frankly throughout the entire pandemic dynamic of, of trying to keep people informed of what's going on. And I think it's through that dynamic of holding those in leadership positions responsible that we get better outcomes in a democracy and um, it's an important functioning aspect of a democracy and we take that seriously and we'll continue to push. It doesn't mean we don't get, we, we get it right a hundred percent of the time, but I think we get it right the vast majority of the time. And the job is to ensure that there's more good that comes from it than anything else. And I think we managed to do that. The second thing I would say in a media company, um, you know, at, at its heart, a good media company is a, a, a bunch of good storytellers and people who know how to tell story in a way that moves the human emotion and the human spirit. And I think about what we do well about that. And, you know, at a company like ours, um, a movie like Just Mercy that we just made available for free on all the digital platforms because of the incredible message it sends around social justice and how the system is tilted. Um, and it's appropriate at this moment in time. But um, you know, there's a, I'm a little frustrated a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about, we have a wonderful movie that's in the can called In the Heights. It uh, was directed by John Chu. And it's, a, it's about community uh, and it's lifting of people up and society up. And it would be such a great story to tell during this period of time when everybody's feeling sheltered and, and uh, going through real, real difficult dynamics and, you know, frustrated that we can't go put it out in front of everybody right now, you know, given the dynamics around theatrical releases. But, you know, we, we believe in telling those stories and when they're told right, they can be incredibly powerful moving society forward. And that probably gets to the third point, which is a little bit what Suzanne was talking about, that you don't have enough of those stories and you don't have enough of those stories probably because there's a degree of underrepresentation that occurs both in front of and behind the camera. And, um, uh, you know, as the company that put the first in diversity and inclusion policy in place in our theatrical production and have been using it and applying it now in all of our projects since that time, you know, we're making progress and we're making headway, but we still have further to go. And we have places where I'm not happy with our progress within the company around, you know, where we stand on our creative talent and, and then mirroring the markets that we serve. Um, so we've got some more work to do there. We're, ma we're, we're making steps in the right direction. But I think if we do, in fact, get the right individuals in positions of responsibility, our stories will be the right stories. They'll be powerful stories. And they will help move society along because you're going to be hearing those authentic stories 
from people who represent the world in which we live in, as opposed to strictly hearing the stories from the folks that have been part of the establishment for a long period of time who have one particular lens on what they think is commercially viable and successful. Thanks, John. You know, uh, obviously, uh, in this uh, uh, pandemic, uh, we, we understand that the way we will experience entertainment going forward, at least in the intermediate term, is going to change. Uh, and, and Mike, I know you have a breadth of experience, uh, really, uh, in, in kind of across all the different ways that we experience uh, um, uh, various entertainment. I was wondering your thoughts on uh, the future of the entertainment experience uh, and when we might expect to see it return to some sense of normalcy or do you see fundamentally the experience going forward will be different? Sure. Um, you know, I think for, for many years now, uh, consumers have been demanding choice and control of their content experience. And, you know, that, that's, that's fundamentally, I think, why um, it, look, John, John's, one of John's companies, DirecTV, start, launched a DVR aggressively back in the early 2000s was to try to address that choice of control. And I think, you know, over the last 20 years, you've seen just innovation after innovation now resulting in, in broadband distribution of, of lots of content. So I think that is a, 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 um, a, a process that will continue over the next many years. Um, but clearly, there's been demand pulled forward for that. During, during this crisis. I think, I think all of our businesses have seen that. Um, I, I, I don't know when, but I, I, I firmly believe that people will go back to movie theaters. I think it, that, that shared communal experience um, is something people want to have. That's why they've persisted and existed and thrived really for the last, you know, 60, 70 years. And I think, they'll, I think that'll continue. Uh, I think a lot of it depends on people's comfort levels as you see people going out, um, you know, clearly before the last week, you know, people were starting to emerge from their homes. They were starting to go to to the beach. They were starting to go to stores and, and, and now restaurants. I think over, I, I don't know how long it'll take, but but it'll, in the not, I think it'll be faster than people think. Uh, but I, I, I'd hazard to put a date on when, when that'll reopen. Um, but I do think behaviors will now have changed for people. I don't, I don't, I, I don't think we're going to go right back to where we were in terms of the percentages of time people spend on different activities. I think it will permanently change. We won't stay at this level, but, but I think a lot of this will, will remain uh, going forward. Yeah, thanks. Suzanne, are you seeing particular kinds of content in this environment that's, that's really uh, becoming more popular, perhaps as substitutes for other sorts of content that we might have had uh, you know, pre-crisis? Um. I am seeing a, a wild amount of consumption is what I am seeing. <laughs> um, we can, I can't uh, produce it fast enough. Um, uh, there, there, there's so much consumption going on. And um, uh, I, I think it's very much, uh, I think it was headed in an on-demand universe gradually prior to COVID pandemic. And now I think we are there never to return, that, um, that, that people want to uh, binge, they want it when they want it, uh, they, want, they want easy access, um, they want choices. Um, so, what, so all of our content is offered uh, for free in front of the paywall, uh, ad free behind the paywall with, um, with extra content behind the paywall, ancillary content. Um, and, uh, and it's very much a, a global, uh, universe too, you know, content that, uh, any, any boy band or girl band Korean content we produce gets consumed, uh, globally, uh, where, you know, there, there's, 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 there's just such a demand for that. Um, it's interesting. So, um, uh. Yeah, no, uh, you know, and we, and we, we, uh, we have not slowed down at, at all. In fact, if anything, um, I have never been busier over the last um, three months because uh, creators are used to making things themselves. Um, so it was um, a, a very natural evolution to work with creators uh, to create uh, content during this time um, and 
uh, now we find ourselves focusing on um, uh, black creators and trying to enhance their voices as well. And I'm glad we're doing that. Um, and and uh, yeah, so so we we've done all all kinds of uh, things, fundraisers, and just um, tapping into the stronger verticals of YouTube, uh, where we know there's uh, a lot of interest, dance, um, uh, music, etc. Thanks. Thank you. I, I, I mentioned earlier, John, you know, congratulations on your recent launch of HBO Max. And I, I have a couple of questions. First, you know, so how you see that as sort of part of your longer term strategy, but also HBO Max is, you know, uh, uh, one of its uh, one of its goals is to provide new content. And we're in a period where it's very difficult uh, in particular to produce live content. So can you tell us a little bit about how this fits in your strategy, the difficulty, let's say, of launching a product like this in this environment, in particular uh, with, with the difficulties of, of producing live content? Sure, uh, the two meaty questions. I'll try to um, be as concise as I can. On the reason for HBO Max, it, uh, it's, it's very straightforward and very simple. I mean, there are very few industries that you look at today where vertical integration isn't taking place. And what happens in that vertical integration, and Mike's company is a, you know, a great example of it, where you know, initially you start out in one part of the value chain. Since we have a group of MBAs here, we'll talk about it in this context. It's a little bit more clinical in its discussion. But since, uh, you know, you start out in one part of the value chain and ultimately work your way back and you compress the handoffs in the value chain. And as a result of that compression, you tend to eliminate margin stacking. And, you know, as Mike demonstrated in many instances, benefits that accrue to the consumer as a result of that. And if you control that entire experience, ultimately, you have an opportunity to build you know a very very broad customer base and in the era of the internet you know we no longer have these structural barriers to entry that were largely driven on the physical world and the internet flattens that out and opens up tremendous markets and that dynamic is impacting virtually every industry including communications and including media and in our case you know we feel it's pretty important at some point in time we need to have a relationship with customers that goes beyond what our typical market structure has been where you know we were hitting the ball out of the park if we have 30 percent of the wireless business or we had 25 percent of the pay tv business it's it's not enough in in the world moving forward to only know 25 percent of the customers in a potential market and so moving in the direct to consumer space and building a product like hbo max allows us to have a price point or a skew that's applicable to most households. It's within reach and relevant to most households and allows us to know who that customer is and have a relationship with them, have a means to be able to transact business with them through billing, get insights as to what their desires are, and then use that to grow the business in other ways and, and frankly build a platform that allows others to be able to distribute into those households and those end user customers down the road where there's a business of scale because this is truly fast becoming a, you know, every industry, a global construct. And so um, we're retooling effectively our, our business at AT&T from one of subscription oriented high skew, you know, there aren't many products we sell that are less than $50 a month to subscription oriented low skew plus ultimately advertising supported but much more broad in terms of the percentage of the customer base it can attach to, and then having deeper relationships with customers and other aspects like our connectivity business. On the production side, it's a, you know, it's a huge challenge. Fortunately, we have a wonderful library in the company. Um, HBO Max could not be in the market right now without the library content that we have built up from years of delivering you know, high quality engaging scripted content, theatrical content out to customers. And as a result of the COVID pandemic, we had to shut down production. Um, there's a lot of stuff that we expected would be ready May 12th, uh, May 27th when we launched that ultimately was not finished. It's three quarters in the can or two thirds in the can or seven eighths in the can and we haven't been able to finish it. Uh, but you know, we felt like the combination of what we did have complete and where we were in the library and our projection for when we would restart production, that we had a viable offering to get into the market, get started, and go through those cycles. 
I can't tell you how important restarting production is for us. Um, you know, AT and T is a big business. We have over two hundred thousand employees around the globe. Um, we've been doing a lot of things that have been essential services since the start of the pandemic. Whether it's you know supporting fire departments and police departments to ensuring broadband works to people's homes. And that's been part of our DNA and what we do every day. But the number one objective right now in getting back to normal, every resource at AT AT&T, not just in the media company, but every aspect of the corporation is targeted toward what do we need to do to get production back up and running in the media company. And so uh, all the resources that we have around getting uh, private and proprietary testing, what we can do on protective equipment, uh, anything that we're doing to work aggressively with unions or others to, to get standards in place that are safe workplace practices that people can adhere to is going toward this initiative because it's so doggone critical. Right. You mentioned, uh, John mentioned uh, scale advantages. Mike, uh, obviously Amazon uh, has extraordinary scale advantages. And I, I want to sort of, uh, you know, uh, juxtapose kind of two different things that uh, we see at, at Prime Video. On one hand, you have scale, which has these tremendous financial advantages, but at the same time, you've recently had a lot of success with, with sort of limited audience, but uh, critically acclaimed uh, content. Can you tell us kind of the importance of that second part, even though there are these tremendous scale advantages for, for, for Amazon? Sure, sure. Yeah, interestingly, I think uh, Prime Video had a lot of success early with with you know critically acclaimed, award winning, winning content. Um, and I think it's you know it's important for creators to know that when they come here, they can they can be you know a, they're they're able to compete and 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 ultimately win awards. That's that's something that's important to them. Um, from a business standpoint, that's also good marketing. It, it's good for market. It, it puts us on the map for consumers as well. Um, most of our investment, though, in the future and currently is on broader, bigger shows and, and films uh, to try to create bigger global hits. Um, you know, one of the, John was just talking about productions uh, being shut down. We, too, had to shut down, I think, 95 different productions around the world, one of which is our Lord of the Rings uh, 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 series that is being produced down in New Zealand. Um, and uh, and that, that we think is gonna be a really big hit. But the other part of it is um, really uh, tightly tailored uh, content in local markets. So we're spending an awful lot of time and effort and money to make local content in Spain, local content in Australia, India, uh, uh, Fran- France, Germany, um, Brazil. And I think that that's, that's equally as important as the larger big scaled event series because Kind of like what I said at the beginning, you know, having content in, in, in your language, you know, shot in your country uh, with, with, with actors and talent that, that tells local stories is, is, is very important. Uh, I'm going to move on to some, uh, some different types of questions before we get to the audience. But, you know, one of the things I've been very proud about at, here at Anderson is really the, the incredible way that our community came together to, to help uh, the neediest in, in these last few months. And uh, I'll say that, you know, after, you know, 26 years here at Anderson, seeing the collective effort, faculty, staff, alumni, students has has probably made me prouder than I've ever been. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the efforts that your organizations are are undertaking to help uh, the neediest in our community? And perhaps, Suzanne, you you could get us started. Um, Well... Google.org is actually amazing and uh, very generous, and um, they uh, are constantly and consistently um, making huge commitments and donations. And I believe Sundar, our CEO, uh, just made an announcement this morning about another uh, commit, long-term commitment um, he's making. And we're and um, John mentioned they did the Just Mercy movie um, that. Uh, is Brian Stevenson's book, um, and Brian runs the Equal Justice Initiative, and uh, we we work very closely with him, um, and have committed a, a lot of funds uh, for him. In addition to featuring him on uh, a, a YouTube episode of a show we call BookTube, which we do once a month, and we featured Brian in his book. Um, but in addition to that. 
we did an enormous amount of fundraising. Um, almost every show we did over the last three months had a donate button and we raised millions of dollars for various uh, uh, World Health Organizations and various um, uh, organizations um, through the work of, of our creators. And it was really beautiful to see them come together. Um, we have a top creator named Mr. Beast, uh, a, a guy named Jimmy, and um, uh, he collected 34 top creators and they did a rock, paper, scissors game. And it doesn't sound like much, but it was very fun and it raised millions of dollars. Um, so uh, it's, it's and, and, uh, and Mr. Beast last year on his own, prior to COVID, raised millions of dollars for, um, doing something called Team Trees um, for planting trees and got people to plant trees all over the world. And he's working on a follow-up to that called Team Seas, S-E-A-S, to help with ocean cleanup. Um, so there's, there's, uh, there's sort of never ending. Um, it's, it, it makes me proud to work at YouTube and Google. Um, really there's a never ending, uh, uh, interest and, um, effort made in, on behalf of giving back. Thanks, John. Perhaps you'd like to tell us about it. It starts at home. Um, you know, we have, we have a large employee base and our employee base is representative of this country. You know, we have, people who are working paycheck to paycheck and um, oftentimes have to balance a lot of different things to keep their home front, you know, in that in check. And uh, we started with our employee base. Um, we reported last quarter that we took charges uh, nearly 500 million that were all driven toward incremental benefits that we extended out to our employee base, base either in increased pay that we offer people for coming in and working to uh, enhance leave options where we allowed people to take time off of work for up to a month to tend to their families and deal with the dynamics that were occurring as they interrupted things like childcare and other issues in their household. Um, you know, there, there were significant steps that we took within our employee base that I feel pretty good about and I think our employee base feels pretty good about. And with, then we went to important partners. Um, we announced, uh, you know, over $100 million of grants that we extended to those that were working in production with us in the theatrical industry and then went further and we actually are probably closer to $175 million now in total commitments back into the industry to support those that can't work in production because of the shutdown. Um, if I think about just grants that we've made out into society, $10 million for special distance learning, education work, um, what we've done to help uh, crisis funds in the media industry. I think we did 8 million in total for different crisis funds in the media industry. We've been giving away free services to schools so that they can conduct distance learning by giving pucks for people to take home to be able to access the internet on a wireless basis to continue learning. Subsidized broadband at $10 a month for food stamp programs we ran the match on you know TV, which was an event that we you know came up with for charity that generated over twenty million dollars of, of donations to COVID relief. Um, you know con contributions to employee relief funds that the business has shown its true colors. We always do well in these moments, and I would say across the board in every aspect of what we're doing, we've managed to hold true to that heritage, and I'm really proud of it, frankly. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thanks, John and, and Mike. Yeah, yeah. I think similarly, um, you know, we've spent, uh, you know, as, as John said, we started with our employees, you know, I think um, uh, on the retail side, you know, added uh, a double overtime for, for, for employees to help, uh, help with the demand that we had to deliver essential services, essential goods to, to people around the world. Uh, we added $2 to the, to their, to the wage uh, during that time as well. Um, we've been donating tablets and Kindles and fires to uh, local school districts and to, to provide to children that need, that need those devices for school work. Um, you know, we have the, a, a lot of other donations around COVID as well in terms of uh, research. We funded a $20 million AWS diagnostic initiative, uh, gave two and a half million dollars to the Columbia University to, to study plasma donations and the treatment and prevention of COVID. Um, and so there's a long list of those things that I want to, you know, it, 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 but, but I think the most important thing is that 
um, you know, as a company and as, a, as executives and as employees, I think everyone is engaged in this um, and, and working together in their communities to, to try to make things better, you know, and, and, and one of the things I'm probably most proud of, and I've only been here 90 days, uh, is that is that hearing, hearing what's happening every day when we meet on a COVID, we, you know, like most companies, we have a COVID uh, call. What are we doing with the, at a senior level? Um, you know, hearing, hearing about the work we're, we did early on to, to track down and locate and produce PPE, not only for our employees, but for, for hospitals and, um, you know, work we did to try to, you know, improve the, the, through, the, the process for making ventilators. Uh, I mean, there are just things that, that companies like ours and John's and, and Suzanne's are capable of that sometimes governments aren't. We can move faster. And I think, uh, I think there's been a lot, of, a lot of those things under the radar that companies have been doing to do the right thing. Uh, not just for a press release. And I think uh, Amazon's no different. Great. So I'll have one, one last question for all three of you, and then I'll go to audience questions. Uh, you know, I'm new to this role, I'm less than a year in, and uh, there's obviously, uh, I, you know, a lot of uh, uh, managerial issues, <clears throat> navigating crises, dual crises now, navigating the pandemic, but also navigating uh, you know the the current uh, the current unrest around uh, social injustices, and I was wondering from your perspective, what are the leadership qualities that you have that you believed help you navigate these uh, these dual crises? Uh, Mike, perhaps uh, you you can get us started. Sure, sure. Um, well, that's a you know I, I humbly wish I had more of them uh, actually because this is unprecedented um, time, and uh, for me personally. Uh, I had about a week and a half in the office before this thing really came into full force and effect. So, um, you know, maybe, maybe slightly differently than, than, than Suzanne and John, I, I haven't actually met in person 90% of my direct reports at this point. Mm -hmm. Most of my meetings have been like this. <laughs> and, so, um, and so what I've been trying to rely on is, is you know, starting, starting with the team, you know, spending a lot of time with my team, uh, helping them spend time with their teams, creating that space so that we can make sure our folks are supported. You know, the little things like, do they have the right broadband speed at home to be able to do their job? You know, do they have childcare? There are so many different uh, things that as leaders we had to focus on early and, and often around are our folks feeling like they can do their jobs at home and how can we help make that happen? Because the anxiety that that people have, they want to do a good job, but they've got their children at home now and they're doing homeschool and, and, and just trying to be sensitive and, and aware of what, what our employees are going through, I think is, is kind of job one at the beginning of this thing. Um, and then making sure that we support them. So, so there's that, I think it's um, uh, trying to instill a sense of um, hope and that, that we are going to get through this and we're going to work together and, and we're going to support each other. I think leading through that empathy and through that, um, you know, trying to find enthusiasm where, where it's hard uh, to have to keep people uh, upbeat and, and, and then giving them the space when they're, when they're not to, to take care of themselves. Uh, it's those kinds of things that I've been, I've been trying to focus on. And then, and then trying to instance, instill a sense of resiliency. You know, I mean, we, we, you know, we, have, to, we have to work hard to, to, for, pers or for our own individual, for each of us to feel resilient. I'm sure all of us on the call have had moments where we're not sure we're going to actually be able to lead in this time and, and, and then being, being sort of able to convey that to your team to say, Hey, I need your help. I'm, I'm not Superman or Superwoman, right? Let's, let's do this together. So that's kind of what I've tried to rely on in this time. And, um, uh, and, and I'm sure John and Suzanne have, have other things too, but that's how I focused on it. Suzanne, any, any pointers for me? Oh, I think that was really well said, Mike, and especially for someone who's been in the job for five minutes. So um, uh, I, I, would, I would just say all of what Mike said, plus um, uh, a lot of listening, um, just making sure that I give my, all my employees time to uh, express themselves, what they think they need, their personal needs are, their professional needs are, uh, the company's needs they should be. Um, conveying those so that people feel heard. Um, uh, we, um, we, we do a lot of um, internal town hall type meetings um, and uh, take 
a lot of questions and um, Susan Wojcicki, who's also an alum of Anderson um, and my boss, uh, you know, is, is really readily available um, and has, uh, and has made a lot of, um, uh, really wonderful internal options and, uh, opportunities for people, um, again, to deal with both personal and professional issues that may arise due to COVID and now due to, um, the racial injustice that, that is, um, we're seeing. Um, so, uh, you know, and then interestingly, you know, one of the things I found was that at the beginning of the pandemic, and we're talking about two different things here, but I'll, originally when this, when we were first going to do this panel, we were focused on the pandemic. Um, originally at the beginning of the pandemic, there was actually a surprising amount of enthusiasm for, um, for this new work from home structure and, and a lot of curiosity and, um, and energy that went into, all right, let's, let's figure out how to do this a different way and work together in a unique circumstance um, and come together. And, uh, and we were able to produce a lot of um, meaningful content uh, that we were proud of that really, I think, um, buoyed the team. Um, but, like anything, you know, that you experience, it, it's hard to keep morale going. And it's hard to keep morale going when you're not together and when it starts to weigh on you that, you, you know, you're not with people and friends and family. And, um, and what seems novel and interesting at first um, can develop into um, a burden. And so... It's a constant effort, I think. It's a constant. It's not like there's there's no bandaid you can put on it that um, fixes the solution. You just have to um, keep working with and listening and working with your employees and and keep responding and evolving um, and executing the best you can. Yeah. Thanks. And 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 John, you have had to manage these various crises, but you also have your own sort of career transition in, uh, much like uh, Mike's recent uh, transition. And uh, just wonder if you have some, some thoughts on how you manage all that that just seems uh, uh, extraordinarily daunting. Uh, yeah, I guess time will tell Tony whether or not it was managed successfully. The jury's still out. We're not on the other side yet. So I, I don't want to sit here and, and offer an observation that I can't uh, can't attest to, but, um, you know, Mike, I think hit some really key points. I would maybe just amplify a couple of the, right now you're using every tool that you have in the toolbox to get through these things. But, um, a few things I would point out one, uh, over communicate, uh, that by far and away, just this, uh, really intense focus on a variety of different ways to communicate. If you think you've said it once, you better say it three times. Um, and I think, frankly, if I look at the survey work we've been doing with our employee base, it's probably one of the things we've done reasonably well going through this cycle is keep them abreast of what's going on. And they, as long as they have some transparency and some insight as to what's happening and how you're thinking, generally speaking, you know, that's over half the battle of keeping them with you. The, the second thing I'd say is from a leadership perspective, you better be willing to make a decision. Um, you better be willing to make a decision probably on more compressed data and more compressed timeframes. And you might be accustomed and comfortable with making a decision. And there are moments in time where getting the input from people is really important. But if you're, depending on where you are stylistically on that continuum of command and control versus inclusive and participative, and we all have some place where we fall on that, clearly when you get into these moments, you probably are going to have to work yourself over into that a little bit of command and control and willingness to make a decision a little bit quicker, more frequently than might be the norm in these cycles. And if you're not comfortable with that, then um, you, can, you can create a lot of problems for an organization. And the final thing to your, I think what you were alluding to in your opening comment is, um, you might be surprised to hear this, as a leader, sometimes you need to be able to compartmentalize things. Um, because if you can't compartmentalize things and put them into a box and contain them, you, you have the exact dynamic you just characterized, which is you can be overwhelmed. You can, you can look at the significance of everything in front of you and have it paralyze you. 
And I, I think one of the coping mechanisms of any leader sometimes is to be able to abstract up, compartmentalize, um, contain, if you want to use that word, the issues that are around you into something that is manageable or neater to be able to manage them and communicate them out to the organization. And, and I find myself doing that probably a little bit more frequently than normal at the moment. Thank you all. So I'll go to some uh, audience uh, questions for the next 10 or so minutes. And uh, I'm gonna merge a couple of questions around kind of shorter form uh, uh, sort of methods of, of delivering content. And this is around the future of, and I'll give just two examples because there seems to be a theme here, of, of uh, TikTok and Quibi is just two examples of kind of shorter form uh, content. Um, Suzanne, your, your thoughts uh, on that? Well, um, I, I do have an opinion about that, but I, 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 I know that a lot of people don't agree with me, so I'm just going to say it. <laughs> um, I, uh, uh, I, think, I think really short, short form programming is, is ephemeral and it's fun and there's a place for it in the world, but it's like gaming. It's just games. It's, and, and it's not what drives um, sustained, uh, committed, long-term participation or engagement. TikTok, I think, is, is doing it right because it's positioning itself a as, um, you know, as, as fun and games and consequently skews extremely young. But Quibi, to spend as much money as they did and go so high-end for the short-form programming, mm, mm, I question that, uh, you know, um, I, I, now you're talking about someone who does shorter form programming for a living, but um, by short form programming, the minimum we do is usually 10 to 15 minute episodes, and we usually do eight to 10 episodes at a time. So the viewer is getting a, a substantial, uh, and we usually drop it so that they can binge watch it. So they're getting a substantial amount of, of entertainment value. Um, so that, that's where I come out on, on the super short form programming. Thank you. Uh, one of the questions, uh, actually a series of questions is, I think, you know, uh, how we see the future, and we, some of you alluded to this earlier, of traditional experiences that are really central to our culture, like going to a movie theater. We had a previous guest talk about you know, how, uh, you know, the experience of, of, of watching a movie, for example, is, is so enhanced by being amongst, uh, uh, you know, a broad group of people in a movie theater. And so it really kind of two parts to this, uh, how you see the future of that experience and then, uh, you know, whether or not that substantially takes away from, from the quality of that experience. Uh, uh, Mike, uh, if you have some thoughts about that. Um, so, I think I think I think the in theater experience is going to evolve and change. I, I think you know you've got every every one of the chains is in some form of financial distress, and um, and it was on the way there before COVID. Um, so I do think that that in theater experience is going to evolve and change, and 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 customers are demanding different different things when they're at the, the at, at the movie theater. But as I said before. I do think that communal experience is something that people enjoy and want to have and will seek out um, sooner than sooner than we think. Um, but I and I and I think the the windowing around it, um, you know, John's company and, and and ours and several other digital players just experimented with with a, a film that John John's company did called Scoob, and we did a similar thing with Trolls a month before, where you know movies that were destined for theater obviously. Couldn't couldn't wait for them to reopen, so we premiered them on on a new product. A new we called it we called it Prime Video um, or, or, or Prime Theater. I can't remember exactly the name of it now. Uh, I've lost it, but we we created a new product for this this different window of a movie, and it was extremely successful. And so I think I think as as the theater experience changes, um, as the windows change, I, I think that we'll be able to keep the quality of filmmaking at you know in, in the same ballpark as we are today. Um, that's my hope, and I, I think that the ways people consume, the time that they have to consume it will change, but I think the revenue streams really that will drive the, the budgets needed to make these films will, will be there for, for the right film. Great. And, and here's a related question, John, for you. You know, in, in, 
in some areas, sports and esports are, are, are an example pointed out here. There's sort of very, very innovative ways that we can enhance, that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, businesses are enhancing these interactive digital experiences. What are some of the things that you're, you're thinking about in this, in this regard? So I just, I'd go back to, there's tremendous opportunity here. Um, let, let's go back to the telecast we did a few weeks ago on the match where we did some very rudimentary, what I would consider fairly rudimentary things uh, and took, you know, state golf broadcasts that have been done the same way for probably multiple decades and added a couple of dynamics in that weren't what I would consider to be technical overreaches by any stretch of the imagination. And it's like it's opened up this, you know, whole dialogue of, of social discussion and dynamics and engagement on what was a relatively straightforward piece of four people playing golf that, you know, just created all other facets and surfaces associated with it. So, um, you know, what our belief is, especially as you move away from what I'll call the traditional broadcast linear construct and into the unicast stream where every device and every individual is literally getting their own stream, you start to open up all kinds of dynamics around that level of interaction and the social presence around that interaction that I think can be very powerful for things moving forward. And uh, we're doing some work with the NBA in our lab right now around how do you take the dynamics of, of engagement with a, uh, a, a game that's being played with social communities, we're testing some of the concepts of wagering around it so that there's the desire to not just pay attention to the score of the game, but maybe what's occurring within the context of the game and, and how do you keep people engaged longer from on those dynamics? How do you bring third party data and information in that allows people to participate? There's, you know, there is a wide open space here and I think it's actually applicable when you start to think about what happens to the theatrical experience, you know, a theatrical experience moving forward that's live needs to be better than what it is today. And it can be better if it's done the right way. Do I think we're going to get back to 300, you know, theatrical releases a year in that are live that you go and see? Probably not, but there is some content that will be best in that venue and in that construct that's even going to be better than what it is today. So I think we're now moving into this era where we've seen the disruption of the traditional model it's broken down a lot of the barriers that were long held for decades. And now the race is going to be on to drive more engagement with the customer. And you're going to see these things start to come out and play. And the platforms that this content is sitting on are far more capable than anything it's been on for years. And the level of innovation is just going to accelerate. Great. Thank you. So one, one last question for all of you. you. As you know, we have many MBA students here on uh, participating in this, uh, uh, in this event. And as you also know, uh, this is a challenging time, particularly for our graduates. Uh, we have uh, a lot of graduates. It's one of the distinctions of Anderson uh, that we have a lot of graduates who are attracted to careers in media and entertainment. And this is a difficult time uh, to be uh, starting a career in that industry. And if uh, each of you, perhaps starting with Mike, could give some of our students advice uh, about pursuing a career, what the skills and capabilities that uh, you're most looking for and, and, and broadly opportunities they should be seeking. And uh, Mike, perhaps you can get us started. Sure, you know, um, as John just actually said about the, these platforms and the capabilities they have for in innovation in the future, um, I, th I think what's been really fascinating over the last few years is that the media job is much more dynamic than it used to be, right? And so, you know, it depends, you, you could be coming into one of these companies as a, what, what in the past would have been called the technology product manager, right? And what that, and, and that, that's a whole different skill set that any of our media companies would have been looking for in the past. So, so I would, I would, my advice would be to, you know, assess what you like, what you love, um, uh, network, as best as you can to try to get yourself up on the queue in terms of the interview loop, but be, but, but really look at what the future is, you know, what, what the future of these businesses are, are these platforms and, and really focusing in on product and technology and data science and, and math, those, those kinds of skill sets I think are going to be really important for, for most of us in the future. Um, if you can position yourself 
with your Anderson degree and your prior experience to be able to get in involved in some of those newer areas of the business, I think you'd be set up pretty well. Great. Thanks, Suzanne. Yeah, I agree with that. And I'll add to that. Um, uh, when I talk to graduates um, about uh, getting jobs, um, I say two things that maybe sound at odds from one another, but they're not. One is um, to try and identify, if you can, the fantasy. Start, so start, start big. Start with like, can you, can you imagine yourself in two years, five years, what do you really want to be doing? What do you think you love? Um, which was what Mike was saying when you identify your passions. Um, but then um, uh, be open and be flexible to taking an open door. Um, tr you know, you try and, as, as Mike said, meet as many people as possible. But um, if a door opens and it's not, it doesn't seem like it's exactly on the path to the fantasy, uh, but it's an open door. If if it's something that you think you can do well at, um, I, I encourage people to take an open door because um, you one thing can lead to another, and you meet other people, and you can. It's easier to um, find another job from a job, and uh, and then you have unexpected experiences that way. So. Um, I know that worked out for me, uh, and, you know, and then I started in, in um, uh, reality television specials, which I was not interested in at all, but it was the first job offered to me at ABC, and um, I just thought, I just have to get there. You know, it's not what, I, I don't think I want to work on specials in my career, but I just got to get there and learn. Um, so uh, I encourage people to... Um, uh, not not think too literally literally linearly in their path, um, but uh, but um, not be afraid to kind of go for it. Also, thanks thanks Suzanne and John. I'd recommend retail grocery personally, but insist. <laughs> 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 I think I think Mike hit. You know, I've articulated slightly differently when I talk internally with the media entity. And if you're if you're somebody who's saying traditional media, the Disney's, you know, the the Comcast Universals, the the Warner Media's, um, it's probably a slightly different lens. And if you're thinking about the Amazons or the Netflixes, um, but when I talk internally with my traditional media company, uh, we have you know. A embarrassment of riches of individuals who know how to build great content, tell stories and work things through a production cycle. We, we have a dearth of talent that know how to think about structural business model change that really understand technology and how technology enables distribution and the innovation that I talked about earlier. And frankly, just the ability to manage the dynamics of a marketing funnel from top to bottom all the way through. And so when, when I get up in front of a group of employees and I say, when this company has arrived and is mature and we put as much um, merit on the individuals that are writing the software code and running the, the customer acquisition experience and funnel as we do on those that are creating the content, we know we will have matured to where we need to be moving forward. And I get laughed at a little bit, but... <laughs> That is, in fact, you know, kind of where, in my view, the puck is going in this space. And so if you're the person trying to break in and not go against the current, which is as there's consolidation and there's going to be more, you know, we're not going to see independent studios hanging out there. There's going to be more Disney Foxes and others. And there's going to be a lot of people who grew up in the industry in the traditional fashion that are going to be underemployed or unemployed. I'd be thinking about going to the place where the industry needs to go. And we've talked a lot about that today. And to Mike's point, you're bringing in math, you're bringing in engineering expertise, you're bringing in big data and, and, and marketing expertise that can be married with the creative process of what these traditional companies do so well. And if you can get that blend, you've got a future in what I'll call quote unquote media, although I don't know that we're going to have pure media companies for a whole lot longer, to be honest with you. Well, thank you all uh, really for a fascinating and broad ranging discussion. I also want to point out something that makes me and I know many in our community very proud. 
both Mike and, uh, and uh, John are, are graduates of our MBA program, and Suzanne has been very closely involved uh, with our memes center for uh, including uh, media and entertainment as uh, part of their uh, sort of umbrella. Um, and thank you all for your insights, but also thank you so much for your support and contributions to Anderson. Uh, I really enjoyed our time together. I know our participants do, and please stay well, and thank you once again for participating. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having us, Antonio. Be well. See you. Pleasure, thank Take you. Thank you, everyone.